to the World Human Rights Forum. I'm delighted that we have with us tonight Ms. Muscatine, who's an alumna of the college. She was a Rhodes Scholar here, I think one of the first of the women cohort of uh, uh, Rhodes Scholars, I think uh, <coughs> the very first cohort actually, um, first and uh, studied uh, European politics here at Wadham, um, and we're delighted that she's back. And she's going to talk about uh, her experiences working, uh, first of all, in the uh, White House in the Clinton administration as a speechwriter and then as director of communications for Hillary Clinton. Uh, then uh, collaborating, I think, with Hillary Clinton on her memoir of the White House years, Living History, which some of you may have read. Um, and uh, then her time in the State Department, well, before the State Department, of course, I'm sorry to mention this, but the unsuccessful presidential campaign when she was a senior advisor uh, to Hillary Clinton. Um, and and Lisa, Lisa then went into the State Department, working again with Hillary Clinton as a senior advisor, director of speech writing. Um, and uh, I, I think um, we'll have some very interesting things to say about that uh, period in American history, the, the very successful, I think, period uh, of Hillary Clinton as uh, Secretary of State. Lissa was, uh, before she uh, went to work in the White House, uh, a, a reporter and editor on the Washington Post, one of the great newspapers of the world, and worked on that newspaper for some years. So she's had a really fascinating history, and we're delighted and, um, de delighted and honored that she's here to talk to us tonight. We're going to have plenty of time for questions um, when Lissa has uh, finished speaking, um, and at an event in the House of Lords, yesterday, it was clear that she enjoys questions as much as she enjoys her address and probably more. So please feel free to ask any questions if you like. We will be filming this event to go on our website, so if you don't want to uh, appear on film, don't ask a question. Um, <laughs> it's not meant to be a discouragement. Um, uh, you are all encouraged, uh, warmly encouraged, to ask questions uh, at the conclusion of Lissa's address. So Lissa, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, welcome to your husband, Brad, as well. And I'm going to give another uh, plug for Brad's book. Where is Brad? Brad's over here. Brad is a former senior uh, journalist on the Washington Post who has written a wonderful book um, about Donald Rumsfeld. So those of you who are fans of Donald Rumsfeld, don't read this book. <laughs> those of you who are not fans, read it. Um, and since uh, Lissa and uh, Brad now run the most famous bookshop in Washington, Politics and Prose, I do urge you, if you buy this book, to buy it in a bookshop um, and not on Amazon. Uh, it's a wonderful book. Uh, do buy it. So thank you both for being here. Lissa. Thank you, Ken, uh, for having us here today. Thank you, Linda, also. They were so generous in hosting us last night at a really fun event with alumni at the House of Lords, which of course was an incredible treat, and my husband got a lot of mileage back home by saying that I was speaking in the House of Lords, which most Americans took to mean I was speaking to the House of Lords. So I would have to come after him and say, not to, in, operative word in, so uh, to some alumni from, from Wadham College, but it was great fun, and uh, we had some great questions, and I do enjoy questions a lot, so I will leave uh, quite a bit of time for that. Please feel free to ask me anything. I can't possibly cover everything that I would like to cover uh, talking about my time with Hillary because there's just too much, frankly. So, um, but I will get started in a minute. I did want to thank the uh, helpers of this of this event, uh, uh, Julie Haig and Julia Banfield and their team here at Wadham who have just been fantastic to work with and, and also great fun. But I do want to say one thing to all of you because it's been a long time since I've been back here. I came back for a couple of the Rhodes reunions and I just can't tell you how exciting it is to be at Wadham now. Um, as a visitor, and I hope as a student and uh, or a faculty member, this is a happening place. Um, it really is at the forefront of some of the most exciting things that I can see, frankly, anywhere in the world in terms of recognizing the importance of diversity in solving the world's problems, recognizing the potential and talent of a much wider array of people that we normally think of as being the sorts of people who might have access to, to Oxford and Wadham is really leading the way in shepherding in a new era um, that I think is, is going to be absolutely essential to us moving forward and making progress in the 21st century. And I want to thank 
Ken for his leadership in that, and Linda, and all of you, because you're part of that. And I hope it's as, as exciting on the inside as it, as it seems to be on the outside, but uh, what a tremendous college, and uh, just doing wonderful, wonderful things um, in such a new and innovative, dynamic, and exciting way. So it's, it's really, I really am happy to be here for that reason as well. And uh, I always like uh, doing these talks, and I, I do want to um, start, I'm gonna give you a little quiz at some point, but first I just wanna ask a question. Uh, there's no right answer, so just feel free to chime in if you have an answer. Uh, have you recently, has anybody recently listened to somebody in public life give a speech in its entirety? Let's say in the last six months. No. Yes, oh, at least, okay, so only a handful, okay. Um, can anybody chime in with a speech that you think, that just off the top of your head, you think was perhaps a speech that changed the course of history? Come on, there have got to be a lot of these. No, maybe we should turn low regard for speeches in this audience. Um, uh, okay, and this is, I'm sure I'm gonna get the same answer because we seem to be having, building a pattern here. But you have an election coming up here in a few months, general election. If you were given the opportunity to be the chief speechwriter for any of the major candidates, whether the prime minister, the opposition leader, or any of the others, would you accept it? Yes, raise your hand. Okay, and why would you accept it? Be really exciting. Be exciting, okay, any other thoughts about why it might be fun to do that? Be, I'm sorry? You might make a difference. You might make a difference, okay. And is there anybody who just absolutely would not want to do that job under any circumstances? Yes, and why would that be? The pressure. The pressure, okay. It's so funny, because whenever I ask these questions, it doesn't really matter where I am in the world, uh, it's at least on these two sides of the Atlantic, it's exactly the same thing. People think it's either really exciting and could be uh, a venue and vehicle for change, or it's like way too much pressure and they want nothing to do with it. But, um, you know, I think there, it is a good question in this day and age of why anyone would want to become a speechwriter. I mean, if you really break it down to what speechwriters do, uh, you are at part now, if you're writing at any high level, let's say for a prime minister or president or first lady or uh, candidate for president of the United States, you are part of a gigantic bureaucracy, a gigantic communications apparatus, and typically speechwriters are kind of at the end of that food chain. You have all these people who are make, you know, polling and strategizing and coming up with the message, and then the speechwriter is sort of the lowly person at the end who has to write the speech. So that you know, might not be all that fun. Um, and let's think about it. If you, well, most of you have not even listened to a whole speech in the last six months. Um, but even if you have caught tidbits, that's probably what you've gotten. You've gotten tidbits of a speech, right? You've gotten something that has been highly filtered before it even gets to you because it has to go through the news media or it has to go through uh, social media. Um, and so what you're writing, let's say you write a thousand words for a candidate and how many of those words are actually ever really gonna get to the audience that you're attending it for? Not very many. So that can be kind of frustrating. Uh, and what about this problem? You're writing for somebody who's a terrible speaker. <laughs> and I hate to say it, but you, know, you can turn on the TV here or in the States and you will find this as a frequent problem. So you can sit there and craft you know, the world's greatest prose and it doesn't really matter if the person has absolutely no capacity to deliver it in the way that it's intended. So that can be a problem. Um, and then, you know, I think the other thing is we live in an age of social media and Twitter. It's taking over many aspects of our lives. So really, if a speech is going to be reduced to 140 characters, why bother, right? Maybe you should just come up with the tweet, okay? And I want to get back to this, um, but I, did, I do have to say that because I was getting very depressed thinking about speech writing in the age of Twitter, I actually went back through some historical speeches and tried to see if I could find great, uh, durable, uh, long-lasting lines from speeches that could have been tweets. So I'm going to now, this is your quiz. Okay, you have to tell me who, who might have tweeted this had Twitter existed. Okay, ready? Anybody doing greats here? No, nobody's admitting anything I can tell. Okay, um, okay, that was a big hint. Uh, but it's now time to depart, for me to die, for you to live. But which of us is going to a better state is unknown to everyone but God. Oh, this is Oxford. <laughs> Sure. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, now, if you don't get, if you don't get the next one, then I, I, you have a much further way to go than you. Honestly, I think even I as an American might have gotten it. 
I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and the stomach of a king. Oh, and a king is the king. Elizabeth. The first day. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. When the Spanish Armada was approaching. Um, okay. How about this? From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron yes. curtain has been tended to yes. That's way too easy. All right. Um, okay, now this is, this. anybody doing American history or has studied American history here? You're up, you're, this is, oh, you should have admitted that, this is a hard one. Um, are you ready? This is one of my favorites of all time. The mystic chords of memory will swell the chorus of our union, when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. And what, where was, what speech, does anybody know? Gettysburg. Nope, not Gettysburg. Most people think it's Gettysburg, it's not Gettysburg. First, first inaugural. First inaugural. Isn't that just beautiful? Oh my God. Probably the best writer ever, the best speech writer ever for a president, frankly, was probably Abraham Lincoln. Okay, I'll do, I'm going to do two more, and then we'll get on with this. Okay, and this one, okay, I have to, the, this is sort of truth in advertising. If you count the spaces, this is actually 164 characters. But it's only 138 without, so I'm choosing to say that it would have been tweetable. Um, you ready? I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Martin Luther King in Washington um, in 1963. And lastly, and this is just because I, I don't want you to hurt my feelings by not knowing this, human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights. Okay. Yeah, and anybody know where? The United Nations Fourth World Conference um, in Beijing in 1995, and I'll talk a little bit in a minute about that speech. Okay, well, you guys did pretty well there, I've got to say, that was good. So let me just tell you quickly um, how I came to work for her. Um, as I uh, mentioned last night to uh, the alumni group, I had the great advantage of being completely naive and clueless. Um, I was a reporter for the Washington Post, as Kenneth said, I've been doing that for about a dozen years or so. Uh, but I was a very restless journalist. I had grown up in a politically active family. I uh, did not like the pretense of objectivity and nonpartisanship that was required of journalists. And when Bill Clinton got elected, which at that time, if like me, you were a lifelong Democrat in the States, it felt like possibly the only Democratic president you were going to see in the remaining time of your life. So I started thinking maybe I could go into the administration, and but I couldn't figure out what I would do because I had never worked on a campaign, I had never really worked in politics. And so I found the name of the chief speechwriter and I wrote him a letter and I said, I have not given a dime to the Clintons because I'm a journalist, I have no political mentors, and uh, asterisk, I have never written a speech, uh, but you know, you should hire me. And he politely wrote back and said, well, we're not hiring because Bill Clinton has promised to cut the size of federal government by 25%, and that includes speechwriting. Fine. You know, nothing, nothing much uh, was invested and nothing, nothing much was lost. Uh, my husband and I were planning to start a family at that time. And then about a month later, I got a call from the same chief speechwriter who said, well, actually, we are thinking of having a new position. And it's going to be half-time writing for the president, and it's going to be half-time writing for the first lady. Now, the reason they were doing that is that there never had been anybody designated to write for a first lady. If, there were, if the first lady needed a speech written, which was rare, a presidential speechwriter was just assigned to do it, which, by the way, they never liked to do, but they sort of had to. But in the case of Hillary Clinton, she was the first first lady, first professional woman to be first lady. She was the first first lady to have a staff in the West Wing. She was the first first lady to take on a major policy initiative, which was health care reform. So they figured she was going to need her own speechwriter. So he said, would you be interested? I said, sure. He said, okay, you have to write this trial speech. So I went off and it was a good thing to do because as I said, I had never written a speech. So I had to find out, A, do I have any remote aptitude for this? And B, do I enjoy doing it? Which, you know, it's a good thing to find out before you're doing it 60 hours a week. Um, so I went off and I wrote the speech. And then I found out I was pregnant. So I thought, well, this is probably not the greatest timing because being pregnant and healthcare reform and maternity leave and all these things are probably not going to work out so well. And at that point, you never know if the president's going to have four years, you hope eight years, but it might only be four years. So I called up the chief speechwriter and I said, you know, I think I should pull out because I'm pregnant and, you know, you probably just need somebody who isn't going to have that complication. And he said, well, we kind of want to see the whole pool of candidates. So if you could stay in, we'd really appreciate it. Um, so I said, okay, whatever. So I wrote more trial speeches, and the pool of candidates got smaller and smaller, and I got bigger and bigger. <laughs> and I then found out I was having twins. 
So then I had to call him back, and this time the First Lady's uh, Chief of Staff was on the line as well. And I was convinced that my career as a speechwriter, which had not yet started, was already, you know, history. It wasn't ever going to happen. And they had this sort of eternal silence before they said, well, we'll get back to you. And about a week later, they called me back and they offered me the job. And the reason that I like to tell this story is that it wasn't until several years after that that I was in a random conversation with Mrs. Clinton's chief of staff and the subject of my hiring came up. And she said, you know, there was a big debate about whether to hire, which I had not known at all. Never, I, nobody had ever mentioned a thing. Everything had seemed to go swimmingly well. Um, and she said, yeah, you know, people really were worried about it. And then apparently Hillary had come in the room, room overheard this debate going on and just said, time out. We're hiring the best person that, that we think can do this job. And I don't care if this person has one kid, two kids, or 10 kids, we need to make it work in the White House if we want any other employer in the United States to make it work for women or men in this position. And so I tell the story because, A, people always say, well, how can you still be working for her? How why are you so loyal? Why do so many people stay with her forever and ever? And that's one reason. I mean, she gave me an opportunity, opportunity of a lifetime, but also stood for a principle that mattered to somebody in my position. And so, um, I, like to, I like to tell people that story because most people don't realize those sorts of things about her. Um, I'm going to tell you a couple just quick stories about actual speeches and uh, sort of the rude awakenings that happened to me early on in my career, which were probably fortuitous. One is that you, okay, so I was this person who was all chomping at the bit to be partisan and I was now not a journalist and I was free of those constraints. And I was a little cavalier about my speech writing ability, even though I had never written speeches. And the first week on the job, I was assigned to write the president's announcement of the new aid czar, okay? Now, as journalists, I was used to writing very quickly. I was used to assembling lots of material and getting it right and uh, distilling and so on. So I was very comfortable with the idea that I had to write the speech in one day. I was assigned to it, you know, assigned it maybe in the morning. It was due the next, it was gonna be given the next morning. I went off for lunch with one of my fellow speechwriters. This was, by the way, pre-email, pre-texting. We all had to carry these clunky beepers around. And I'm off at this lunch, and it's about three o'clock in the afternoon, and the chief speechwriter is, you know, beeping me like crazy, and he's, you know, and I, I'm thinking, what is wrong? Oh my God, there must be some crisis. So I rush to a phone, and I call him, and he goes, where are you? We need this speech, you know, it's tomorrow morning. And, I'm thinking, wow, this guy really needs to chill out because honestly, it's just like a one-page speech. It's not a big deal. It's the Azar, for God's sakes. What could possibly go wrong? I go back. I write it. I, he's, you know, calm him down. And I'm just totally sort of annoyed that he's so upset about this. And then the next morning rolls around 9 o'clock. I'm supposed to, uh, the president's going to give this speech in the Rose Garden at 9 a.m. And I think, this is cool. I am going to get to go and watch the president of the United States speak the words that I have written. Like, this is awesome. So I go over to the Rose Garden, and it's a beautiful day, and um, <laughs> I see this line of television cameras, probably the length of this wall at the back of the Rose Garden. And I see the podium in front of those cameras with the seal of the President of the United States on it. And all of a sudden, my cavalier cocky self turned into a puddle of worried, panicking jello over the possibility that one tiny thing might be wrong in what I had so quickly and cavalierly written because I suddenly realized the immense power of what comes out of a president's mouth and the immense responsibility of leading that person correctly and not inaccurately. And so, uh, you know, it's really lucky that that happened to me the first week because I learned my lesson on a very, unfortunately nothing was wrong in the speech, but it was a really incredible realization just to see those cameras and see that seal and know the president was going to be uttering those words. And they were going to be disseminated around the world in a matter of seconds. And once they're out, there's nothing you can do to take them back. So that was the first kind of rude awakening. Um, second one, and somebody asked me about this last night, was uh, I had to write a speech for the president. He was going to roll out his big health care speech to the nation's governor. So this was a big trial before it was going to go to Congress. And uh, I worked like a slave on this. I worked so hard on this speech. It was, you know, it was pretty long, it was about four pages. I just massaged it and crafted it and tried to get it in the best possible condition, made sure it was seamless and the, the narrative worked and so on and so forth. And in the White House, when you're writing for the president, and I, I'm quite sure this is true for a prime minister as well, you have a checklist 
uh, before a speech goes to the president, and you have to get various people on that list to vet it and check off that they vetted it. And so I had done all the vetting, with the exception of one senior advisor who, uh, for whatever reason, hadn't been around or something. So he called me at the last minute. He said, can you bring a copy of the speech over? I really need to read it right away. And I said, sure. And he was uh, one of the president's really right-hand hand folks whose office was really uh, just a few steps from the Oval Office. And so I went over there and I had the speech and I was very proud of the speech. You know, I thought it was just sort of poetic and literary and all you know, the things I had worked so hard on. And he uh, re started reading and he was reading, he had a pen in his hand and he was reading extremely quickly. There was no way that he was taking in the great, you know, magnificent photos that I had produced. Absolutely clear, clearly not doing that. And he was going through the first page, and he went through the second page, and then he came to the third page, and he took his pen and he stabbed the middle of the page. And he said, that's it. That's the sound bite. And I realized that was really all he cared about. He didn't care how beautifully I made the argument. He didn't care about the content. All he cared about, getting back to our 140 characters of Twitter, what was gonna be filtered into the, into the audience. That was it, that was all he cared about. So that was a little bit disillusioning, I have to say. And it does make you wonder, why do I even bother to do this? Um, I'm just gonna tell you uh, the story of the Beijing speech, because the two speeches that I think of Hillary's are the most famous to this day, or certainly probably the most important, and probably the most challenging she ever has written. Um, one is that Beijing speech, which sort of lives on as you know, one of her classics, um, and seems to have incredible shelf life. Uh, and the other was her 2008 convention speech where she uh, was under, uh, there's a lot of doubt about whether she was really going to endorse Barack Obama at the Democratic convention in Denver. And so this speech had huge stakes. Um, so she had to convince that audience that she really was going to endorse him. But uh, let me just quickly tell you the Beijing speech and then we can talk about a lot of things and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, but I do want to talk about the Beijing speech because the, the lead up to it was kind of fascinating. So at that time, China, those of you who are too young to know this, uh, was not the China of today, right? It was a, it, China was dying to sort of get global recognition and to sort of start putting its toe out on the, on the world stage as an important player. But it was nowhere near where they are now. And so for them to host a United Nations conference was a big, big deal. So they were ecstatic that the UN picked this conference to go to Beijing. And then, wow, talk about a bonanza, Hillary Clinton is gonna be the keynote address at that conference. So China's like, this is great, right? They get the conference, they get Hillary, it's gonna get all this attention, they can look like they're real players. Well, they then did something very odd that kind of undermined that position. They arrested a guy named Harry Wu, who was a, a, who was a, a, a naturalized American citizen born in China, who had gone back to China and come in through one of the north, uh, northern provinces, and they arrested him and said he was a spy. The conference was in September of 95. This happened in June of 95. This created an enormous diplomatic circus, for lack of a better term, in which uh, the United States was divided over whether Hillary should go or not. If they go, are they condoning their awful human rights policy since it's a sham arrest? But if she doesn't go, is she letting down women all over the world? And there was this back and forth within our country. And then there was a back and forth between the Chinese and us. And really what it came down to, I think, is that it was a game of chicken where the Chinese finally blinked, and about two weeks before the conference, they realized if Hillary Clinton does, for now, and now the conference, by the way, has gotten even more attention than it ever would have because of this controversy. And I think they realized that if she didn't come, the conference was nothing, no one was gonna pay attention, and they would look even worse, so it was better to take the risk of having her come, even with this controversy in her hip pocket, which she was upset about with them. So, um, so we worked on this week. We had a very small, tiny group working on it. Uh, just her, uh, me, her deputy chief of staff, and one other person. And we had a really, what I thought was a pretty good draft done before we left. We, our staff met her and President Clinton in Hawaii. They had been vacationing in, uh, in, in Wyoming. Um, we met in Hawaii where they had some events and then we had to fly from, uh, obviously we left the president, then we flew from Hawaii to Guam. Actually been to Guam. Um, and then on to Beijing. And so, by which point we thought this speech was quite good. And so I had to give her the final draft. She was up in her cabin on the plane. This is where you really hate to be the speech writer, by the way, because you're on the plane, it's like this long flight, everybody else is sleeping, 
and it's always there's always one light on the plane that's on, and there's a poor person with a blanket, like another computer. It's always a speech writer. There's always a speech writer. the one doing the last minute work. So I was doing the final touching up of the speech, and I took it up to to Hillary's cabin to give to her. And this is super corny, and so you really have to forgive me, but it really does mean a lot to me genuinely. Um, and I, I think about this all the time. You know, again, why would you sit in front of a blank screen and be on the plane in the middle of the night and do this crazy job with twins and everything else? Okay, here's a good example. So I take the speech up to her. Now, obviously, she knows the speech inside out at this point. And I, I hand it to her. And before she says anything, she just kind of looks at me. And then she says, you know, I just want to push the envelope on women's rights and human rights as far as I can. And I just was blown away. Because I thought, this is the First Lady of the United States. This has been a hugely delicate and difficult diplomatic minefield she has just had to tiptoe through. And she is still willing to use the platform she has and her voice to go into this fairly hostile terrain and make this point on behalf of all these people around the world. And I just will never forget that as long as I live. It was one of the proudest moments I had both working for her, but frankly as an American. It just was, wow, to use your, the power of your office that convincingly and, and with that much conviction just meant so much to me. There's a funny story about what happened after that. We did go, and, and she had to give a couple other speeches first. We got to the hall, and this deputy chief of staff and I were very confident in the speech. We just thought it really, really worked. And um, we were on the side of the stage, and Hillary took the stage, and she started talking. And the audience, which had people from 189 countries, hundreds of people, was, you know, just silent. They were like statues. They were completely unemotional. There was nothing. There was no, there was barely any sign of human active, of any human anything going on. And so we started worrying, like, oh my gosh, have we completely misread this audience? I mean, we, oh, yeah, and we got increasingly panicked, thinking, we blew it. We blew it. We thought we had this nailed. We blew it. This is going to create some horrible international incident. You know, this is awful. Uh, and by the way, there had been some worries among people on the president's staff, you know, that she was going to go off and do something crazy, and, you know, that would be a big nightmare. Um, and so the speech went on and on, and it took until about the end, which was 18 minutes. And we are by now look like we've been plugged into a, you know, an electric socket. We're so nervous. And the speech ends, and the entire place erupts. People are cheering. They're mobbing the state. Even the person from the Vatican was happy. You know, it was shocking because she talked about all this, you know, pro-choice stuff. Um, and this deputy chief of staff and I looked at each other. We're like, are we dunces or what? And then we went, oh my god. The reason no one was responding during the speech is that they're all listening to simultaneous translations in hundreds of different <laughs> languages. So they're not in the same place with the speech, and we have just, you know, been, you know, too. Uh, Un untutored to know that. So, um, and then the funny, other funny thing that happened was we went back to her suite, and this was like when Beijing had one nice hotel and we were staying in it. And we went back to her suite, suite, and they had given her, you know, some fancy presidential type suite. And we were all exhausted, and we're sitting around, and Hillary uh, said, um, gee, I really wish I could see a copy of the International Herald Tribune, now known as the International New York Times, I guess. Um, and we're like, yeah, that'd be great. She goes, yeah, I haven't seen the news in a few days. It'd be so good if we could get the paper. And we're like, okay, whatever. And we're all just sitting there. And about 10 minutes later, we hear this thump outside her door. And we go, and we open the door, and there's a copy of the International <laughs> right there for us. <laughs> so then we would start looking at the TV and the mirrors in the bathroom and say, oh, I'd really like a milkshake right now. <laughs> Unfortunately, all we got was the International Herald Tribune. Um, I'm going to um, stop in a second and, and take your questions. And I, you know, I could tell you a lot of stories about things that can go wrong. Where I can tell you a lot about uh, speeches where you think you have the outcome assured and you don't, like the New Hampshire primary in 2008 when we were sure Hillary was not only going to lose but lose really badly coming off the Iowa caucuses. <coughs> and it was going to be really depressing, and the speech was sort of, how do you make lemonade out of lemons? And so at noon, you know, we were working on this speech. And then the polling started coming in, the exit polling, and uh, it looked like, well, it's not going to be a double-digit loss. It may be like eight or nine points, so it's like, okay, well, it's like sweeter lemonade. 
Um, so we rewrote the speech, and then as the afternoon went on, the polls came in and it looked like it might even only be three or four points, and then we changed the speech again. And we kept changing it, finally the polls closed, and she won, and we didn't have a speech. <laughs> so she had to completely wing it, but um, those, those kinds of things can happen too. Just getting back to why speeches matter, you know, why, would, why, after all that I just told you, would you really do this? And especially when so little of it actually ever sees the light of day. And I would say a few things. One, um, one of the purposes, I think, and the most important purpose, is you are really helping the speaker, whoever it is, crystallize their own thinking. You know, if they aren't forced to make a case for what they believe in, or a policy that they're trying to present to the public, or some issue they're trying to galvanize people around, then we're in big trouble. You know, they need to be able to articulate why and how. And short of having to do it in a speech, they might not really have to do it. So it forces them to really have to crystallize their own thinking and articulate their case. Um, so I think that's one thing. Um, you know, obviously I think it contributes to civic discourse because those of you who might be in a room listening to a speaker speak are gonna get the benefit of that uh, public, public uh, official's temperament, the way their style, what you, what you really think of them, you get a different dimension. But I think perhaps the most important reason is that speeches are part of the public record. And I can't emphasize enough how important this is, even though it doesn't seem like it is. And I'm gonna tell you a quick story, uh, just to end, that I was telling um, Ken last night, who's obviously an expert on um, the legal system and the justice system and what happens in situations of abuse of power. But for the, for the time that I was in the White House, which was most of the Clinton administration, and some of you may know this, the Clintons were under investigation by the Republicans in Congress almost from day one. And it started over this land thing they had in Arkansas and it morphed into you know, every permutation imaginable and then of course Monica Lewinsky um, at the end. There was also an early investigation of something called Travelgate, which was that Hillary had tried to replace some of the people in an office in the White House that makes travel arrangements for the press. And the opponents claimed that she was trying to install, uh, I think, a cousin of Bill Clinton's or some totally ridiculous thing like that. And so the that became scandal. This, you'll understand why I'm mentioning that one in a second. But the point is that we stopped keeping emails, memos. We would do everything verbally if we could. We were so cautious about what to record because everything was getting subpoenaed. Everything was getting subpoenaed. And, it, and, and the subpoenaing itself became a distraction to the work of government because you had to spend an unbelievable amount of time trying to find records to, you know, to, for this congressional committee or that investigative committee or, and so on. Everybody on Hillary's staff was subpoenaed. I was subpoenaed. I had to hire a lawyer. I had to spend you know, a couple thousand dollars on a lawyer. And why was I subpoenaed? I was subpoenaed because, and, we, and my lawyer was trying to find out from the prosecutor's office why I was being subpoenaed. Well, finally toward the end, uh, they said, well, they thought I had something to do with a letter that had been written about Travelgate. Um, it had been written by somebody named Lisa Caputo, who was Hillary's uh, press secretary. My name's Lisa Muscadine, so I'm not, gonna, not really that close. Um, and it had happened three months before I was hired. So my attorney kind of pointed this out to them and said, you know, this is really harassment at this, case, at this point. And they said, no, no, no. And I was subpoenaed and then uh, I had to go and testify, I was called to testify, before a federal grand jury in Washington. Now that is no joke, okay? So on the appointed day, I show up with my attorney at the federal grand jury in Washington, the courthouse, and there's a phalanx of cameras because they record everybody who's being hauled in before this grand jury. And I'm supposed to testify at noon, and at 11.59 and 59 seconds, they, one of the staff members of the investigating committee calls me to a side room with my attorney. They have several FBI agents there. They have the audacity to try to crack a joke, which I was not amused by, I must say. And then they proceed to get my name wrong, my date of employment wrong, and pretty much every fact about me wrong. This was the level of research going on. And then they dismiss me and say, no, you're free, you don't have to testify. But, that happened to everybody on Hillary's staff. It happened to most of the senior team at the White House. Okay. When you leave the White House, at the end of your time, you also have to go through a checklist to sign out, and you have to give back your Secret Service badge, and you have to give back your beeper, and all these things. And then the last thing that on the checklist is to go to the White House historian, who's in the basement of one of the office buildings, and 
talk for 30 minutes. And they say a lot 30 minutes because we do an oral history of everybody who worked in the White House. So I go through my checklist, I leave the oral history for last, I go to the White House historian's office, and I walk in and he signs it, he goes, well, you're done. And I said, wait a minute, what about that? the 30 minute oral history you're supposed to do? He goes, oh no, no, we stop doing that. We don't do that because that's gonna be subpoenaed. Okay. So basically what that means is there's no internal record of the Clinton White House because none of this was kept. But Ken Starr, who was the independent prosecutor, wrote a 40,000 word document about the Monica Lewinsky scandal. And with the hit of a send button, was able to disseminate that to millions and millions of people around the world. So the public record really matters because now we have that version of history out there, but the actual version of what happened basically does not exist. So for me, speeches, really are a, a check on abusive power. They're a check on, uh, on our understanding, well, they're, they're, they're an addition to our understanding, they're an, an essential to our understanding of history, to the place that all of these ideas and all of these characters and actors have in the course of events as we've experienced them. And so I think writing speeches, even if they're reduced to tweets, is both incredibly important. It's also really, really fun. It's extremely exhausting, I will say. Um, and I hope some of you, uh, if I ask the question again, like that all of you would be raising your hands, although I'm not that optimistic, but at least maybe more of you would be raising your hands. And I would love to take questions, and please, I will try to answer um, everything as candidly as I can. There are probably a few things I can't go into total detail on, but um, please feel free to ask about anything. I'm happy to answer. So thank you so much. So, um, questions? Can everyone say who they are before they, before they ask their questions? As it looks like Hillary Clinton is going to be the Democratic nominee in, 19, in 2016. Uh, do you know if she is behind Barack Obama's nuclear initiative for Iran? You know, I would be a fool to start speaking for her in concrete terms at this point because she has not outlined her policies and I would not want to, uh, I mean, this is sort of a cop out. Um, but, okay, I'm gonna try to answer this tactfully and diplomatically. Uh, I think she's tougher on most foreign policy issues than he is. I think she might uh, take a slightly stronger hand with Iran, however, I don't think that she would be supportive of what Netanyahu's proposing, if that's what you're asking. I mean, you know, she's not a zero-sum game kind of person. And so, you know, everything in between to me is fairly nuanced. Um, she does tend to be a little more muscular than Obama on most foreign policy issues. Uh, but she would, she would be, she would be, she would certainly be supporting him now one wholeheartedly if she was in the State Department. I mean, she would, she would have to, right? And I think that so much closer to her position, even if there's a nuanced difference. Is there a specific part of that that you're asking no, about? No, just that she's been very quiet on the subject. Well, you know, I, I don't think it's her position as the former Secretary of State to say anything. I mean, there's a current Secretary of State whose job now is to be working with the President and is part of the administration. And I think it's really unhelpful for a President when former cabinet members start spouting off what they think. Uh, we've seen this happen with a number of these um, memoirs that have come out. Not hers, actually, but you know, uh, Gates's and some of the uh, Panetta's. And, and there's just, to me, there's something unseemly about going after the guy or challenging him or contradicting him or saying you didn't agree when A, you were serving at his pleasure and B, he's still in office trying to get this job done. And really, I think, unless you can, unless you can support the point of view of the commander in chief and the president, then you should, if you can't, you should not be in that position, you should resign. You should make your best case, and then you should know, okay, he, you know, the, the buck stops, stops with him. Once he's decided, I gotta do what I can to support him. And that would very much be the way she would view this, and I certainly know she would not comment if she were opposed to what he's doing at this point, especially at this point in those negotiations. I mean, she could, she would totally derail it if she said anything now. But I do think she's way closer to, if there's a difference, it's not gonna be, there's not gonna be a lot of daylight between them. Yeah, there's a few actually. Thank you. Um, 
how do you Sorry, think... Sorry, could you, could you just identify yourself? Sure. Mark Tashian from uh, Queen's College. Okay. Uh, how do you think social media has changed the nature of speech writing in, in the modern day? Um, did everybody hear that? How, did, how has social media changed the nature of speech writing? You know, I'm not sure it's changed it so much because it's really the same as looking for the sound bite, right? I mean, I think the issue is how do you... It, it's, it's not so much the, the content as how fast things are disseminated. So once something is out, it's out, and if it's wrong, it's wrong, or if it's a misinterpretation, or it's um, a criticism that is hard to undo, it's very hard to, uh, to um, get beyond it. And so, what, you know, Obama really is the one who revolutionized the use of social media in a positive way for a campaign. And I'm not sure it affected his speech writing. He gave the same speeches. But his, his people knew how to use social media to com communicate and convey for him in a way, and reach an enormous audience in a way that Hillary's campaign, frankly, horribly failed at. Horribly, horribly, horribly failed at. And Obama was masterful at that. And it's one of the reasons he got elected and she didn't. Um, I don't really think it's changed the way we think of I mean, speeches to me still have the same purpose and function. Um, and social media is just an extension and an amplification of the communications process about everything related to the speech and the person giving it. So, probably not a very satisfactory answer, but I'm not really sure it's changed. It's changed the way we write speeches. Okay. Hi, Martin. You're on the fellow here. Well, uh, my question about speech writing, and I like your anecdote uh, about the important speech where the senior advisor just went in his sleep, ignored parts of it, looking for the sound bites. So my question is, when you're crafting these speeches, what's the balance between crafting a speech that you know, will be powerful when you read or hear the whole of it, you know, where the, the balance of the argument and building up the argument is important, as opposed to inserting these sound bites for your part, in a sense? And also at the same time, perhaps preventing <coughs> sound bites that your political opponents could use by putting bits of it out of context and so on. So what's the balance between the whole argument and these, you know, discrete sections? Here? Yeah, that's a great question, and I, I think that um, you have to consider all all three of those things for sure. Uh, you know, you really do want to make the argument. I mean, the speech is the speech, um, and so I think you try to have the narrative arc. You try to have. Uh, you know, Bill Clinton, if I heard him say this once, I've heard him say this a thousand times, you have to have the theory of the case. And he would, you know, he was always like, the theory of the case, the theory of the case. And we, what's the theory of the case? And um, so you, you had to know why you were making the speech, what the case is, and then you had to have the supporting evidence of it. And uh, did any of you watch the 2012 Democratic Convention speech that he gave on behalf of Obama? How many of you have seen that speech? I think it's one of the all-time great speeches. And you know, it, it, to make your point, sort of get you, I don't know that there's a sound bite in there, probably were a couple, but he winged it. I mean, he was extemporizing for at least half of that speech. Um, and he's just so good that the 48 minutes long, the total speech was the case for the Obama presidency that, by the way, Barack Obama had not been able to make for himself in four years as president, right? And it took Bill Clinton, who had that theory of the case thing going on, and just this unbelievable ability to connect with, I don't know if you watch, remember, he would say, nah, nah, yeah, nah, you gotta, nah, this is really important, so you gotta, because this, this, I'm gonna tell you something, it's, it's real important now. Obviously that was not written um, into the speech. He's just such a natural at that. But you do have to worry about what can be used against you, absolutely, and that's why you have people vet it. You know, you, I had, I was reading a draft of, uh, a speech that somebody's working on for Hillary right now, and it's a, a guy who's a very, very good speechwriter. And he had a reference to a young woman she had met some time ago, and it was referring to how attractive, you know, this young and attractive woman. And I wrote him, I said, whoa, what, you know, uh, wait, what? Of course she can't say that. You know, so can you imagine if that got flipped around potentially? Um, so, you know, you're trying to look at the, the theory of the case and have the big speech completely as airtight as you can, but then you also have to know what is gonna be quoted out of it, good and bad. Um, so I don't think you separate out and prioritize as much as you have to do all of those things very, very consciously. Yeah. This one down here. 
Hi, my name is Tamara spitzer -Bick. I work um, in media law and policy here at the law faculty. Um, one of the most iconic sort of speechwriter relationships with the president is obviously Ted Sorensen and Kennedy. Um, and that was painted or always has been painted as a very close relationship where the ideas sort of bleed it into each other in their working relationship. So A, my question is how, to, how common do you think that is and possibly in your experience, but generally in the current profession? Um, and secondly, the way that you describe the speechwriter being at the very end of a very complicated process of vetting um, I'm interested in the dimension of all the analysis on the data of what what words specifically should be used based on feedback as to, I, I've heard about it for the climate change debate, climate change versus global warming, for instance. And so how much of that data analysis in a way gets incorporated in this kind of high level speech writing and how much freedom do you have as a speech writer to say, well, actually my creative or my instinct is to say, no, yeah. <laughs> screw the data. <laughs> okay, remind me of that question if I forget how to answer the first one. Sorry, but yeah. uh, no, no, they're both great questions. Uh, the first question is really uh, how close are speech writers to the people they're writing for? And I think it's a great question because I think it's changing. And um, you referenced Ted Sorensen, of course, was uh, in, you know, decades ago and one of the great, great speech writers. And I think most presidents up until now, and even now, I think President uh, Obama has a pretty close relationship with the speech writers. But, you know, when I was naive enough to think I could be a speech writer without ever having written a speech, I mean, part of the reason I didn't, I mean, there wasn't any such thing as taking a speech writing course, there weren't speech writing firms, there was no profession. People tended to come into the profession from other, you know, lawyers, journalists, professors, academic, whatever, would come in and be speech writers for a few years and then go back to what they did. It wasn't thought of as a career. Now it's thought of as a career. Some of my good friends uh, from the White House started a firm called West Wing Writers, which is a Democratic speech writing firm in DC. They cannot, they are swatting away business. I mean, they can't keep up with the demand and they do corporate, nonprofit, and political speeches. And, you know, they're, they're really high level, but there's room for plenty more of them. Um, and there are speech writing classes, I don't know if there are at Oxford, but in the States now you'll find these speech writing courses. And here's what bothers me about that element of it. You know, I could count, and um, there are lots of good speech writers in Washington, let's say, that probably here in Oxford and London. Um, but I could count on one hand the number of great speech writers. And I think what's happened is it becomes sort of a mass kind of industry, if you will. It, tends to become more formulaic and robotic. So you'll go to these, I sometimes am invited to these speech writing classes and they'll have a textbook and they'll say, okay, you have to have an anecdote and then you have to have um, a really good quote and then you have to do this. And all these people are going and manufacturing these speeches based on certain kind of rules. And they lose what a speech, a speech is an organic thing. You know, it's a human being with their own subjectivities and emotions and opinions trying to talk to other human beings with their own subjectivities and emotions, and to kind of reduce it to a formula is not very helpful, I don't think. And so I always tell them, okay, break all the rules. If you don't have a good quote, I mean, first of all, only use a quote if it's fantastic. Only use an anecdote if it's really good and it really helps tell your story. Um, and so you see a lot, an awful lot of speeches now that are really not that good. The other reason they're not that good is because everybody wants to have a speech writer. You know, there are people, and when I went to the State Department as Hillary's director of speech writing, and we had a speech writing team for the secretary, I was responsible for her speeches. I was shocked to discover that there were 35 speech writers at the State Department, writing for, you know, the assistant secretary for Europe, the assistant secretary for this, the assistant secretary for that. They were populating the entire thing, and they weren't really speech writers, they were sort of public affairs, but also writing speeches, and every assistant secretary, an undersecretary, and ambassador and this and that wanted their own speech writers. So there's been this proliferation of demand, proliferation of people doing it. And by definition, these people are not gonna have those kinds of relationships. Um, I used, people used to ask me if it's harder to write for Bill Clinton or Hillary. And I would say, well, I, I much prefer and was better at writing for Hillary. And they said, oh, well, that's because you're a woman. And I'd say, well, that's probably part of it. But it's actually comes down to as much how you think how do, you make, how do you make the case? And I just, not that I'm on the level of either of them, nowhere close, but how my mind works is more akin to how hers. It's a more logical, sequential way of thinking. Whereas with Bill Clinton, you know, forget. I mean, I could, I could write a good speech for him, but not a great speech for him. I also had the incredible benefit of being so around her all the time. I probably, I used to joke, I got to know Bill Clinton better writing for Hillary than I would have had I you know, been full-time for him. 
because he had eight or nine speechwriters by the end. You know, the chief speechwriter was doing most of the talking to him. And, but we were working with her, we were in the residence all the time, we were hanging around, he was there, he would talk, you know, I got a much better uh, sort of feel for him working for her actually. Uh, but I'll tell you one quick story about how important that proximity is. Um, when we were working on Living History, her memoir from the White House, uh, and what happened was um, we, had, we thought we had nine months to finish it and that got compressed into four and a half months because they moved the publication data. And so we were just round the clock working at her house. She was in the Senate, so she was at the Senate and then working at home and we were round the clock with a little team of us at her house. And the first page of this book was awful. I mean, we were getting very close to the deadline, and it was just, you know, I couldn't stand it. I knew she didn't really like it, but we were all running around in circles. We were all exhausted, and so, you know, and it was just a struggle to figure out how to fix it. And I happened to be sitting with her, having another sort of, again, a completely unrelated conversation. And she said, you know, I wasn't born a Democrat. I wasn't born a senator. I don't even remember what she was talking about, but it was not about the book. It was not about her career. It was just random conversation. And she said, you know, I wasn't born a Democrat, I wasn't born a senator, uh, and it just, the light, the light bulb went off, and I thought, that's it? You know, and I said, excuse me, and I went up to the study, and I got the computer, and I wrote the first page of the book, and I took it back, and she goes, oh my god, that's it. But it was just serendipitous, because I happened to be there with her in a completely random situation. And, you know, I've, uh, one of the speechwriters I hired at State was a young woman who's really, really talented, um, and she was there for four years, and then she, uh, got hired to work in the Obama White House, she maybe has met the president once. You know, it's really hard to write for people who you're not around with just hearing how they talk, not about a speech, but just how their, their tone, their nuance, how they think, how they, you know, how they, they kind of approach things. And so I think that's why that lack of access has meant oh, many fewer good speeches and many fewer good speech writers. Oh, and you had a second question about... Uh, well, you know, all these all these people have pollsters and message gurus, and um, if you want to really know a lot about the Obama administration, I highly recommend David Axelrod's book called Believer. Uh, he was the main message guy for Obama since 2004, his first Senate race, um, and he talks a lot about this kind of thing. But no, you can't override what the pollsters and the message people tell you. Now, that said, you've got to be really careful to let polls guide you and not dictate you. And I think one of the big mistakes in our 2008 campaign, frankly, was that um, we paid too much attention to a pollster who was extremely convinced that the numbers told everything and forgot that sometimes those numbers might not be true to the person who was running and was not gonna allow that person to be herself. And so it can be very, very dangerous to become over-reliant on that. It's, it's, it, but you do have to pay attention to it. student in the law faculty. Uh, I have two quick questions. One was about um, what do you think is the significance of these recent revelations about the use of private email um, during the um, State Department years? And also, if there is a 2016 campaign, do you think that the communication strategy would be similar or different, or just how, how would you think of approaching that? Um, those are both great questions. The first was about, does everybody know about this whole email flap that's happened in the last few days? Um, if you don't, the short version is that uh, the New York Times reported a couple days ago that Hillary had uh, violated State Department and federal archiving rules by using a personal email as Secretary of State for her four years as Secretary when she should have used, an, should have used a State Department government email account. And she was the first secretary for whom these new rules were being applied, um, but she did all this stuff on her own email and um, recently turned over about 55,000 pages of those emails uh, so that they can be properly archived. Um, I don't know enough about actually, I've read a lot in the last day and I'm not there, so I'm not really sure where I feel like the truth lies. Um, you know, look, I think at, at best, it was uh, an accidental but stupid screw up. Um, and at worst, you know, 
it's hard for me to think she was really trying to hide a lot. I think for her, knowing how busy she is and knowing the, the, the crush and rush of starting at State when she did, and I was there for it, we were all just running around like crazy and overwhelmed. I think it was convenient. She liked, you know, she had her Blackberry. She liked, she had her account on it. She liked using it. It was easy, and she probably just didn't think about it. And by the way, no one on her staff, um, people who probably should have said, hey, you really need to do this, did that. So that's not a good thing. But, you know, it's not a good oversight. It doesn't help her in any way, shape, or form. And by the way, you know, the defense to many, many people sounds pretty darn flimsy. So what the actual, you know, I've read a couple of things that said, well, you know, it was actually okay to use your own email as long as it was recordable. And then other people are saying, no, 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 it had to be a government account. So I'm not sure which is right there. If it's okay to use your personal account and she just didn't turn over the stuff in a timely way, it's a little less bad to me. Um, what was your second question? Yeah, uh, the scenario difference in a potential 2016. Oh, 2016. Oh, God, let's hope everything is different about uh, a campaign this time. Um, you know, look, she, that was not a good campaign. Uh, at, at that time, uh, in two, at this time in 2007, she was clearly had a lot on the nomination and was well ahead of Barack Obama in the polls. But I think part of what happened in that campaign is that um, and she was running for the first time. You know, there were a lot of questions about what role her husband would play. That was not an easy decision to figure out, uh, and that became an issue. Uh, and then I think that, um, you know, there was an interesting thing. Her campaign started off with the slogan, uh, I'm gonna go on a listening tour. And that was very true to her. She had done that in Arkansas, she'd done it as First Lady, she did it running for Senate, she's a, and she, by the way, she's a tremendous listener. So she was gonna go around the country and listen to people. Within about, uh, a week or two, that changed. The reason it changed is because some of these sort of high-priced uh, strategists um, who were advising her, one in particular felt very strongly that her greatest liability was that she was a woman and she was gonna have to be the first woman as commander-in-chief of the armed forces. And this was gonna be you know, something that was gonna not sit well with most, most people in America. And so the idea was to then have a slogan that was, I'm in and I'm in it to win. Now, I have to tell you, even at that point, I, my jaw kind of hit the table when I saw that, because to me, every, the one thing that everybody knew about Hillary Clinton in 2008 was that she's tough. Nobody doubts the strength of the woman, nobody. I mean, if we like her, hate her, love her, what, it doesn't matter. You know she's strong, she's tough, she's resilient. What you don't know is the arc of her life story. You don't know that she's 40 years a social advocate, a crusader for social justice, a fighter for women and children, a crusader for dem democracy and human rights and women's rights. Those are all things that could have been amplified in a kind of movement kind of campaign, much like Obama's was, right? And instead, that was kind of thrown out and it was like, I'm the big Democratic Clinton machine, I'm gonna roll over you, kind of like Clinton, won Clinton uh, two instead of Hillary one. And I think a lot was learned from that. There were also other things that went wrong. Uh, there was a big debate about well, whether you, how to use the internet and social media which Obama completely destroyed her on. Um, there was a big debate, I don't know if, how much you know about the, the way our uh, primary system works, but we have caucuses, and delegates are, are gathered from these caucuses, and we have primaries. And Obama was very smart to have a very heavy caucus strategy, because he knew he could organize at the grassroots. Hillary's advisors did not think she was gonna need that, so they focused on the primary states like New York and California and Indiana and Ohio, and places that have are delegate rich, but, where you don't have to go through this caucus thing, and they just ceded way too much ground. And so even when she started kind of getting back to who she was and making progress, it was too late because the delegate count was insurmountable. So all of those things have been learned, and she is assembling a team now, um, assuming she's gonna run, that is, I think, gonna be far, far different and hopefully far superior. So I'm optimistic, at least for the moment. Email, emails notwithstanding. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm Renato Garim from the law faculty as well. Um, there's another woman in the Democratic Party besides Hillary, and I think it's very interesting. A few. <laughs> yeah, a few, a few, but there's another uh, female leader, uh, and it's not Claire Underwood. Um, it's Elizabeth Warren. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think of her? What do you think of her approach, political speech, and 
her, her association with Main Street and the idea that Hillary could be close to Wall Street in that sense. Because I do remember Bill Clinton's, in that speech, uh, Clinton arithmetics, you remember? Mm -hmm. uh, but I do remember as well uh, Elizabeth Warren. And Elizabeth Warren made, made some very important points on corporations and revolving doors and lobbying. Um, what do you think of that? Uh, are the, have any of you, or most of you, followed Elizabeth Warren at all? Senator from Massachusetts, uh, former law professor at Harvard, um, kind of a champion of uh, working class and middle class, very populist themes. Um, and so she did a couple things that raised some eyebrows. She, first of all, she raised a ton of money in her Senate race. And I mean, for a little teeny Massachusetts, she raised, like, I think $25 million, which is crazy. Um, and so she had a lot of that money left over. <coughs> And she then wrote a book. Now, when people have raised a lot of money and written a book, what do we normally think? They're running for something higher than the office they are then in. In her case, that would be the presidency. And so there was a lot of you know, banter in Washington about, oh my god, Elizabeth Warren is going to challenge Hillary from the left. And she doesn't have the negatives of Hillary, and she's got this message, and so on. Um, I don't think she's going to challenge her. I do think she is trying to push her from the left in a good way. I also don't think, I, I happen to love Elizabeth Warren. I think she's great. She's really articulate. She's really, she's really fiery. She's got a very, very clear, very, very compelling message. She has figured out how to tap into the um, emotions and anxieties and aspirations of working and middle class people in our country, which, you know, have a lot of, of whom have felt unheard for many years, even with the Obama administration. And she's just sort of found that exact touchstone that she needs to kind of relate to, to that uh, constituency. That said, Senator from Massachusetts, I mean, I used to, by the way, I really often thought of her as the kind of female Barack Obama. I thought she's not really that interested in the Senate. She really wants to do something more. She's very, she's got very clear on her message, and she's got the kind of, um, you know, she's got the ability, the speaking ability, the fundraising capacity to really do it if she probably wanted to. She would have a very hard time getting on president. You know, and I think she knows that. And I think her, her, I think what she's doing now is to push Hillary from the left. She's not going to run against Hillary. There's no way. And I think she's made that pretty clear. Um, but she's positioning herself, and she's really, really appealing. She's also, by the way, you know, she is kind of a one-note Johnny. I mean, it's really easy if all you have to talk about is that one thing. She's not talking about foreign policy. She's not getting a question about Iran. She's not getting a question about. You know, immigration, and she might, but it's not really that relevant in her state. So, you know, it's pretty, it's easier for her to sort of take over that lane and just stay in that lane and go 60 miles an hour and just, you know, blast ahead. But she's, no, I think she's terrific. She's a great, she's a great person for the Democratic Party. Uh, my name is Evelina Rabakis. I'm one of the law fellows here at Forum. Mm -hmm. um, and I teach European law, amongst other things. Um, and I would like to ask you a question about women in leadership positions. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what female leadership means to you. Um, and I don't necessarily mean leadership by women. It might mean that there are certain leadership qualities which could be characterised as more feminine, more masculine, but could be exhibited by both men and women. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what does the, the term or the notion of female leadership mean to you? Mm -hmm. And do you think it can make a specific contribution to um, tackling some of the many major issues that we're currently facing, whether it's the economic crisis or Islamic State, the Ukraine, um, the list is pretty long at the moment. but. Um, yeah. You mean like if all the leaders of the world were women, would we have uh, global well, peace and prosperity? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> great. You guys have a bet. I, I, I put my money on that. No, no but more along the lines of, because I think some people might argue that um, women bring something to the table that might make a specific contribution to tackling those problems, but I don't know if no, that I, would be specific to women or just... You know, you're, you're raising a really interesting question, and I think the sort of... Uh, conundrum in trying to think about it is that for women to get elected now into, and if you mean political leadership, but even if you, you know, to become a CEO of a big company, you know, Marissa Mayer or, um, you know, some of these other women who are now huge Fortune 500 company leaders, um, you know, 
they have to exhibit very male qualities, unfortunately, in a way. They have to be really tough, right? They have to, you know, there, there's the notion that you have to, you know, it's what Ginger Rogers said about dancing with Fred Astaire. She had to do it on high heels and backwards, right? You sort of have to do everything a little bit better. I think it's true of minorities as well. There's somehow this other added burden of proof. And women who are smart and ambitious and aggressive and, 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 and have characteristics that we typically think of as positives in men, are viewed as negatives in women, right? So that's just, I think, a pretty agreed on fact, at least in, 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 as a generality. Um, but then you have women, when they get into these leadership positions, can they exhibit a different kind of leadership? And I think what, if I had to describe what I would hope feminine leadership would be, it would be a greater premium on listening, a greater premium on consensus building, um, and on sort of pragmatic solutions without egos getting in the way. So, I mean, one of the things that I think was great about Hillary when she was in the Senate, for example, and she was this way with foreign leaders too, she's really pragmatic, okay? So she would um, work with Republicans who had voted to impeach her husband if it meant getting a child welfare bill through or, you know, some other bill that she cared about. And she would hold her nose and she would do whatever needed to be done and she would, you know, and she, and she, she was counterintuitive to them. They didn't expect her to be like that. They had sort of stereotyped her as the witchy, bitchy, you know, strong, nasty person. And what they just, you know, and then suddenly she's charming them and she's doing this and she wants to work with them and suddenly they have to sort of be allies with her in order to get what they want. And she's kind of, you know, navigated the system by both being, you know, tough and strong and resilient, but also, sort of saying, look, I'm not gonna sit here and let my ego get in the way of getting this done. So I think, but I think it's really, I think it's a very hard thing because there's so much, I mean, if you look at the women leaders who've been successful around the world, you know, they're really tough. I mean, they have to be really tough and really strong. You know, Angela Merkel or Margaret Thatcher or, you know, Golda Meir or Indira Gandhi. I mean, they're just, Ellen Johnson certainly, if you can just go throughout the, you know, any hemisphere pretty much. Um, and I think for them to get there and then also be able to do the more consensus sort of listening and softer way of bringing people together is hard to do. You know, this system doesn't allow a lot of work. So the, the solution is to just get a lot more women in these positions. Because once you have a critical mass of people who, you know, can operate that way, it becomes easier to operate that way. I think. Okay, we've got, I think we've got time for, for, for are you okay to take Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, We've okay. got time for one more, I think, so just down here. That guy up there has had his hand up, so maybe okay. we should we'll, do two we'll more. We'll take two, two, two can more. You keep, can you keep the questions quite short? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll try to keep the answer. The problem is the answer. I'll, I'll try to keep the answer. I've got a question at the end, though. Oh, okay. So that's three more. Oh, okay. So I worked at West Wing Writers last summer. And oh, you um, did? I did. Who did you work with? Uh, sort of Jeff Schessel. Yeah, and, uh, I love that. Yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, but one thing that a lot of the sort of your former colleagues talked about was how there were very few female speechwriters, mm -hmm. um, and one reason that they said was that a lot of Washington operates on these sort of old boy networks that people get jobs because they're recommended for them by people that they know, um, and I think this is a struggle that women have in reaching high office in all, you know, either in politics or business or a lot of ways. Um, so how, what recommendations would you have either for large scale policy changes or for sort of at the systemic level? Um, for changing those systems to make sure that women can get into those positions, or for individual women trying to navigate those systems? That's a really hard question to answer. And your assessment, and I think their assessment is completely right. I mean, one of the things that was most disturbing to me about the Obama administration, right, first African-American uh, uh, president, he had not a single woman in the White House speech writing office. Well, that's after, he had, he had one after a little while no non-white men. Okay, Bill Clinton had an African-American chief speechwriter at one point. He had women throughout the whole time. Um, you know, he was massively good on diversifying his entire administration. It's really depressing to see Obama sort of have, and by the way, his White House has a bit of a reputation as being kind of a frat boy, white boy, White House. And, you know, there have even been complaints by people on Mrs. Obama's staff and people who are close to her about it. Um, so it's been, it, it is, and you know, that was where the fundraising came from. That was where a lot of the talent pool came from. I am really upset because right now, some of the top people that Hillary's looking at for her next campaign are 
that same mold. In fact, a bunch of them are Obama people. Now she's got some. She's going to have some women who are in, in really important positions, but you know she's always had. I mean, her chief of staff was an African American woman. Her her uh, one of her top advisors was a Latina woman. Uh, her her you know first aide was um, her most important aide um, is Muslim American. So she was really good on that sort of stuff. But again, I think it's you know the numbers. I mean, you just have to start populating these things. But if the president is not going to appoint people who are uh, more representative, it's really hard to break into it. I mean, Emily's is doing a great job of raising money and getting people involved and getting women elected, and then hopefully those women also involve more women. But it takes a long time. Okay, final. Is there someone at the back? Yeah. Oh. Hi there, um, Christian Sosa from the Harrington School. Um, I was just wondering, having written speeches on domestic and international issues, whether you found that there's been a difference in the content included in the demand for the content from the audience in what you would include in your speeches, both from the domestic and international communities. Yeah, I think there's definitely a difference. I mean, you ha it's much harder to kind of gauge an audience for an international speech. You have to rely on a lot of advisors and foreign policy experts um, to make sure that you understand the nuances, which are not going to be naturally understood to you, um, and that you understand the context in which you're, the person is going to be giving the speech. Right? You have to be so aware of um, whatever kind of tensions may exist on the ground where the speech is being given, what the dynamics are politically, what the dynamics are culturally, uh, are there certain protocols that have to be observed or not, things that you just would know as second nature in your own country. Um, and, and typically in, um, in a domestic speech, you, know, you really know your audience pretty well. Not always, I mean, some of these people have gotten up and not known their audiences sometimes. Uh, but um, at least they get the nuance pretty well. But in, in a, there's so much in a foreign speech that, I mean, the littlest thing can go so terribly wrong and, be, and, and, and cloud the entire speech. Whereas, you know, in a domestic speech, it's just, you know, there are gaffes that are made, which are just kind of somebody, you know, probably not being prepared well, but I don't think it has quite the same I think there's a, it's not a greater responsibility, it's just, it's just a little uh, greater degree of tension when you're thinking and working on an international speech. I mean, I would not, I'm not sure, I mean, maybe I would have, but I don't really agree with them, so I probably wouldn't want to, but can you imagine being Netanyahu's speechwriter for that speech in Congress yesterday, or the day when it was yesterday, I guess? That'd be pretty stressful. Talk about having to know your audience. Anyway. I wanted to ask you about the, the, um, the American right, and and really to ask you where, the, where you think this rage comes from. One of the things you, you, you mentioned yesterday in the House of Lords was that Fox News is now the most watched news channel in the United States, and we've seen the, the activity of the Tea Party in recent years. And this kind of manifests itself in a, in a way that can be quite sinister. I, I remember quite strongly, people don't remember it now quite so much because it applies even more to Obama, but when Bill Clinton was in power, there was a section of the right wing that just couldn't accept his legitimacy as a president. They couldn't accept the results. Mm -hmm. So that traditional idea that whether you vote for a candidate or not, once he becomes president, he's commander in chief, he's the president, and you, you kind of- You're at least respect him. Yeah, you, you, you kind of respect him for that, has gone. And Bill Clinton suffered from it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that fed the Ken Starr investigation and the rest of it. Obama suffers from it even more. I mean, there's a whole section, isn't there, of the right wing that just doesn't accept his right to be president. Oh, I mean, pressure. I think Obama's had it far worse. So where's this? Where's this? Where's this? Well, coming here's from? one answer. Um, if you go way, way, way back, if you go back to 1964, when Barry Goldwater got annihilated in the presidential race by Lyndon Johnson. Goldwater's Republican, Johnson was a Democrat. Succeeded Kennedy when Kennedy was assassinated. Um, it really obliterated the Republican Party, at least at that moment. And what happened was that a lot of very, very uh, wealthy um, millionaire types who were part of the American right, who were, um, by the way, as time went on, Goldwater's not even, not even viewed as conservative. Anymore. I mean, back in that day, he was viewed as sort of to the right of Attila the Hunt, but now he's kind of like, you know, moderate to right, he would be viewed as moderate to right Republican. 
But what happened was a number of um, uh, very, very wealthy Republican financiers uh, came together and decided that they had to create, a, in essence, a Republican infrastructure to take on the Democratic Party. And they were very smart and they were very patient and they knew it would take a while. And so they raised and spent lots and lots of money beginning to do that. And how they did that was, and what you see now is every major publishing house practically in America now has a right-wing imprint, right? They started populating uh, uh, and endowing chairs in law schools. They started something called the Federalist Society, which I'm sure the, the law fellows are aware of, which also started sending its students to Solicitor General's offices and to counsel's office throughout the government. And you, know, and, and you go down the different gradations of American government and you start seeing sort of the tentacles of this movement, um, you know, I don't think infiltrating is too strong a word, infiltrating and taking over and newspapers and magazines and, and Fox News and all these instruments um, that are used to achieve political ends become uh, sort of the tentacles of this right-wing financial operation. So I think that was part of it. I think Bill Clinton got a lot of the rage. Um, he just, people, you know, that, the Republican Party just didn't know what to do with him, you know? Here's this guy, he sounds like this, you know, and he was so smart, and he just, you know, he just befuddled them because he's such a great politician. And, you know, I've often thought how Bill Clinton would enjoy this Congress, in a way, because he would be, you know, unlike Obama, who's, um, you know, brilliant and wonderful, but, you know, sort of wants to keep his distance from the, sort of, you know, people that he views as sort of unseemly in the Republican Party. You know, Bill Clinton would be calling him up at six o'clock. Can I come? I want to have breakfast with you today. You better be here at seven. I'm going to be up on the hill. I'm going to come to your office right now. I'm going to come meet you up, you know. And he would have been, you know, he would have just enjoyed the game of politics with these guys. And he did. He completely, he completely undid Newt Gingrich. Completely undid him. And, you know, but Obama's not, doesn't like politics as much and isn't as good as Clinton at that kind of stuff. But I think what happened is the Tea Party really took off with the recession. You know, suddenly jumped. I mean, are we surprised that we have the rise of the Tea Party, the recession, and the unbelievably nasty, hideous anti-immigration movement coinciding? And you know, this ridiculous amount of time and energy spent on is, is Obama a Muslim? Was he really American? Is you know, just, is he? Oh, now you know we had the latest one that where one of the Republican presidential candidates refused to answer whether he thought Barack Obama was Christian. I mean, honestly, that is the level of, of idiocy that we have, and I think you have all that constellation of forces coming together with enormous amounts of money. This race, okay, what Hillary Clinton is going to face? You think emails are bad? She is going to go up against this attack machine of Fox News. 24-7, right, every hour of the day. And what's hilarious, if you watch the late night comedians in, in America, what they now do is they, they go and they have the little snippet of the day from every Fox News anchor throughout the day. And you know, one of the, I remember when we, there was the climate change thing uh, debate was going on and suddenly all these Republicans were trying to get out of sounding as idiotic as they usually do, saying, uh, well, I'm not a scientist but I know it's really cold out there, but I'm not a scientist. And so, you know, they would show this kind of montage of, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a scientist. And they'll show, and it's all parroted, and it's all orchestrated, and it's orchestrated between Fox and some of the Republican leadership and some of the Tea Party people and so on. You know, it's, you're gonna run, have to run that gauntlet, which is not fun, pleasant, or easy. And then the Koch brothers and some of these other right-wing financiers are gonna spend up to a billion dollars and thanks to the Supreme Court case of a few years ago, Citizens United, they pretty much can do that. You know, so it's it's not pretty. And I think she is gonna face this constant, you know, it, it's not even gonna be attacks that are legitimate that you just have to respond to. It's gonna be made up stuff. I mean, they'll just, they just will, I mean, could you make up more stuff about Barack Obama if you tried? Probably not. I mean, they just have this entire little, you know, operation that does nothing but, you know, quote, dig up dirt that's actually just manufacturing stuff. And they don't really care. And there's nobody holding them accountable. So it's it's really sinister. Very depressing, actually. Sort of a sad note. Well, on that very simple <laughs> note. <laughs> um, Thank you all so much. Uh,